Hey everyone, Andy Raffel from eTechnics.com and with the launch of B550, we thought that it's only fitting to make a system and show you exactly how it performs. Let's do this. So when it comes to B550, it's coming in a little bit more expensive than B450, so we thought that we'd go for a budget of around $1,500. We've got an RTX 2060 Super and some pretty high-end gear, including a Rocket 4.0 drive from Sabrent to really give you that blistering fast speed, whether you're gaming or probably even doing a little bit of light editing. This rig is going to be great for that. So let's jump in and start building. <laughs> So starting with the case, we've actually gone with a case from MSI, which I know MSI aren't exactly known for cases. It comes with a tempered glass side panel as well, which is really, really nice. And the reason that I went for this case is it has quite a lot of airflow. There's three fans at the front, non-RGB. There's an RGB one at the top, and we're gonna be putting in a 240 mil AIO at the top as well, which will give us another two 120 mil fans. So now that I've got the case kind of stripped down as much as I physically can, I like to get as much done on the motherboard as I can before I transplant it into the case. So first step really is to remove the AMD retention bracket because the AIO that we're using actually has a kind of proprietary bracket. So now that that's prepared, we can continue to put our processor into place. And we've gone with the Ryzen 5 3600X, a very, very respectable CPU. Now to put it into the socket, it's just a matter of lifting up this arm, which opens up the socket, and then you'll see there's a little arrow here, and there's also one on one of the corners of the processor. Line them up, simply slot it into place, it will hold there. I always like to put a little finger on there, and just put the arm back down. So on this particular build, we're using a PCI Express 4.0 drive, which is gonna give us blistering fast speeds. Now on this particular board, being B550 as well, it's the top slot that has the ability to utilize the speeds of PCI Express 4.0. There is another slot on the board, but that's only 3.0 speeds. Now we're using the Sabrent Rocket NVMe 4.0, one terabyte drive. And it's just a matter of lining up the little notch here on the notch on the slot. You can only really do it one way, and it's in place. Now inside the motherboard box will be a tiny little screw, so you can just secure it into place like so, and then you can put the heatsink back on. So next up is the memory, and we've decided to go for the Adata XPG Spectrix D60G. This has got pretty much as much RGB as you could ever physically fit onto a memory module. We want to put it into slots four and slots two, but if you are stuck, you can just refer to your motherboard manual. You also see that there's a little notch on here which lines up with the notch on the motherboard. Simply line it up and push it into place, and then exactly the same for the second module. Line it up and a little bit of gentle force and push it down. Now for the AIO, we've decided to go with the Cougar Helor 240, and this is the backplate for it. Now, depending on the one that you go for, because other ones are available, you will find that the backplate differs ever so slightly. So please just refer to your manual. We're just gonna slide that under the bottom and then we can continue to install it. So with the backplate in place and these screws coming through on the other side, as I mentioned, refer to your motherboard manual. We then just need to put a washer onto each one, and then we can simply just screw this down into place, ready for mounting our CPU cooler. So once you've got the standoffs installed, you can then take the upper bracket, and as I say, every cooler will differ with its installation, but once that's on there, you can then continue to screw that down into place. So now that we've basically got as much as we can built up on the motherboard itself, processor in, memory in, drive in, and the cooler prepared as much as we physically can, we can now transplant it into the case. So we're gonna turn the case on its side and start screwing it in. So now that we've got a case on the side, you will find that inside every case comes a little box. Inside this one was an instruction booklet, as well as a whole bag of screws and cable ties and all sorts. So really it's just a matter of making sure that you have all of the relevant standoffs for your form factor of motherboard. We're using an ATX motherboard, so everything is already in place. So to install our hard drive, every case is gonna be different, but on this one, we're just gonna take out one of these cages, and on this particular one, you actually open up these flaps, 
Obviously every case will differ, but then you can take your hard drive and line up the holes. So there is holes on the hard drive, and this, in this case, it just simply slots into place, and then you can put these clips back down, like so, and slide it back in. Now that the hard drive's in place, we can continue to put our cables in. So we've got a SATA data cable, which can only go in one way, and clips into place. We can then feed that through one of the grommets on the case and put it straight into the motherboard. So for the power supply, we've gone with the Antec High Current Gamer 750. Other 750 watt gold power supplies are available, but we've gone with this one because it's actually a pretty decent price for what you get. 750 watt, it's got a gold rating on there and is fully modular, which is very nice indeed. It's just a matter of lining all the cables up and putting it into the relevant uh, sort of connectors and away you go. So we've got our PCI Express, our CPU. We've also got SATA for our hard drive. Uh, which is going to go into there and then we can install it into the case. So depending on the type of case that you've got the power supply may go in from the back. On this particular case it actually slides in from the side. Once you've done that you can simply line it up into place and continue to screw it in using the screws provided. It is also worth noting that now we've put the screws in we did put the power supply in with the fan facing down. The reason for that is underneath there is a removable dust filter. So first up, we do have to put in our power connectors. So we've got an eight pin EPS connector on this motherboard. So just line up the connector and put it in. Next up is the 24 pin connector, which is clipped together between a 20 pin and a four pin. Again, line it up into place and it can only go one way and simply push it in. So we had to put in our front panel headers consisting of our HD audio connector, our USB 3.0 connector, and the front panel headers. It is worth noting that if you do get stuck with these, please refer to your motherboard manual. So with everything else kind of done inside the case, it's time to finish up with the cooler. So we've got to put two fans on there, which simply go on like this. Just be careful of the orientation of where you want your cables to be once it's inside the case. There are other AIOs on the market. We went for this one because it looks pretty cool with all the colors, but anywhere around sort of 100 to $120 or pounds, you're gonna be able to find competitive 240 mil AIOs. So on this particular case, we actually need to take the top panel off, which is just a matter of kind of lifting it up and the whole thing comes off. Now, I did mention about the fans and the orientation that we're gonna go with for very good reason, because this is exactly how it's gonna look. So it's just a matter of offering the AIO up and then we can screw it into place. Take the top cover, line it up and push it back down into place. Now, some CPU coolers will come with thermal paste on there. This one doesn't, it actually comes with thermal paste in the box, but it is worth noting that you do have to remove this. So please don't forget it because I see it all the time. Take it off like so, and it's ready to be installed. Now, looking at the CPU socket, we wanna take some thermal paste. I like using Notchua just because of how it distributes and the temperatures that we get. And you just wanna put a small P amount. It is worth noting that there are other methods you can use, including the line method, the cross method, and the verge method. Hopefully someone gets that joke. Then we can just take our cooler, orientate it the way that we want to put it, line it up to where we want it to go, and take the included screws and screw it into place. Very nice. Now coming off the actual pump are two cables. One of them is a three pin fan header cable for the pump and the other one is for the RGB. So we just need to feed these through and tidy it up just a little bit. So it's time to put in our graphics card. Now, generally speaking, every case is gonna be different. On this one, there's a little panel just kind of protecting everything. So this is our graphics card. It's the MSI RTX 2060 Super Gaming X. It has eight gig of GDDR6 memory. It's basically pretty beefy as far as 2060 Supers go. It's just a matter of lining it up and then giving it a gentle push to put it into place and screw it back down. Just hold the graphics card up a little bit just so it's kind of in place and continue to screw it down. And lastly, with our graphics card, we just need to put in the PCI Express power cable. In this case, it's an eight pin, which this comprises of a six plus a two pin. It can only go in one way and push it in. So the last real thing that we need to do is plug our hard drive power in, which can only go one way, so just line it up and give it a gentle push. There's also power for the RGB on the front of the case. Again, line it up 
and clip it into place. So the build is done, at least in terms of the hardware. So now all we've got to do is install Windows, get all the lighting synced up so it looks, you know, amazing, and then see how it performs. Let's do this. So first game up, Borderlands 3 at 1440p. Uh, we're looking at high settings on this one and we're getting anywhere between 60 to 80 frames per second, which is well above that magical number. Next game up is Metro Exodus. As we know, this is a pretty demanding game, but even at 1440p on high settings and also with ray tracing enabled on high and DLSS on, we were looking at anywhere between 60 to 70 frames per second. And I've got to admit, it looked absolutely amazing. So next one up, even though I'm not a massive fan of the game, we're looking at Fortnite. And again at 1440p, and we're on epic settings this time. So basically top end. And we're looking at 75 to 90 frames per second. This means that you could in theory go up to a 4K resolution and still get some pretty achievable results. Next up we have Grand Theft Auto 5 at 1440p, very high settings and running the benchmark built-in tool, we were looking at between 100 to 120 FPS. I mean it's a pretty demanding game but as you can see, still getting some really good results. Next game up is a personal favourite of mine, we're looking at Call of Duty Modern Warfare but we're actually looking at the Warzone element of it. At 1440p on high settings, anywhere between 60 to 80 frames per second. So uh, even in them sort of massive firefights on a battle royale mode, you're still going to be getting some amazing sort of, you know, frame rates. The next game in our suite of benchmarks is Doom Eternal. This is actually very, very well optimised and at 1440p we were able to crank things up into ultra nightmare mode. And we was getting anywhere above 80 frames per second all the way up to 115. Now I've got to admit, it's a great game but damn is it difficult when you crank up that difficulty level. So anyone who's watched my live streams before will know that I absolutely love The Division 2 and at 1440p we are looking at high settings, we're able to get anywhere between 65 to 80 frames per second. If you haven't checked this one out yet guys, I would definitely recommend it. And lastly, looking at Elder Scrolls Online for all those MMO fans out there, at 1440p ultra settings, we were getting close to around sort of 100 frames per second. Obviously during the kind of, you know, big fights and things like that, it did drop down a little bit, but still well above 80 frames per second. So there you have it guys, that's the system in all its glory with the performance results as well. I'm sure you're going to agree with me that for $1500 it's a pretty well balanced system that absolutely sort of chews through 1440p gaming and also gives you the scope to increase that resolution up to 4K at a later date if you wanted to. There's a lot of room for future expandability as well and just overall a nice looking build. So you have it guys, hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, you know exactly what to do. Be sure to check out our Patreon and our merch store if you fancy supporting us, and I will see you in the next video. See you later guys, bye bye.